I'm uh, just delighted to introduce you today to my fellow computer architect and old friend, Mark Hill from the University of Wisconsin. Mark and I were graduate students together at Berkeley. And it was actually at Berkeley that Mark developed a piece of research for which he is still well known today. This would be a classification and model of cache behavior that let us actually understand not just that they perform, but why caches perform. This would, was called the three C's, standing for compulsory, collision, and conflict misses. And it was named after a tiny little restaurant where we, this means graduate students, would go have lunch in Berkeley, also called the three C's. But in this case, it was cappuccino, crepes, and something else that I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, Mark uh, is a faculty member in two departments at Wisconsin, this is Madison, Computer Science and Computer Engineering. He has done almost all of his work in uh, some arm of parallel processing, beginning with what I will characterize as the definitive work on weak uh, consistency models with Sarita Adve. Also work in cache coherence and in technologies to develop infrastructure, simulation infrastructure for um, parallel machines with David Wood. This would be the Wisconsin Wind Tunnel Project. And now he's working on another Wisconsin project with Wisconsin in the name, Multifacet, also with David Wood. And they are investigating issues in programming and designing multi-cores for web service. Today, uh, he's going to share his thoughts with us on extending Amdahl's law. Thank you, Susan. And I really appreciate that you didn't tell any good stories. <laughs> so I'm really happy uh, to be at the other UW. All right, so many academics love to do very complicated things. And one of the things I strive to, tr I strive to do some of the time is to do really simple things so that we can see the forest for all the trees. And this is an example of this. So when you're listening to this talk and you're thinking, isn't this too simple? It is simple. OK, so I was sitting in a bar okay, with Thomas Puzak of IBM. Uh, and he observed that everyone knows Amdahl's law, but quickly forgets it. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, this guy must be a total nerd if he's in a bar talking about Amdahl's law. <laughs> But there was a reason for that, because the next day I was supposed to debate uh, Graybeard Yell Pat with Graybeard moderator Joel Emmer on single-threaded versus multi-threaded. And there I argued strongly for multi-threaded, but a lot of this have got me thinking, and that's what the result, the result is this paper and uh, talk. All right, so let me give you the bottom line uh, at the beginning. So, we're going to develop a simple corollary to Amdahl's law. It's going to be as simple as Amdahl's law, but it's going to be for the hardware. Okay, and it's going to basically say that there's fixed resources that hardware designers can spend on the cores, and if they spend more of this resource on a core, they can make it go faster, but not in proportion to how much they put in. Okay, it's not too many assumptions, but yet a whole bunch of things will follow. Uh, one thing, which is no surprise, and you don't need this model to do this, is that we need a lot of parallelism or we're not going to get a lot of speed up. So for example, if you have 99% parallelism and 256 cores, how fast can you go? 72. You can speed up by 72. You've already lost that much at 99% parallel. And the first time I saw that, I didn't believe my student's math. And I computed it myself, but it's right there. So, we're going to need to figure out ways of doubling the parallelism. So there's no doubt that we need parallelism. Okay? But what this talk is going to be is somewhat about trying to stop the pendulum swing to just thinking about parallelism and consider some of the other things. And we're going to find from my model that you, when you have larger chips with more resources, you're going to often want to increase core performance, not just increase the number of cores. We're also going to see that there's some value in having asymmetric designs if you can overcome the problems where one or a few cores are enhanced. And the value of that increases as you have more resources. And finally, if we can do it, if we can somehow dynamically shift our resources around to serial peril, that's even better, although it comes with a lot of problems. And so this talk is about this potential uh, so that we can then want to overcome the problems to see the potential realized. So, uh, but I'm going to start off uh, with a little on the side 
where I did some analysis of how the research world was preparing for this big multi-core explosion, because we are the leaders after all. <laughs> I'm going to remind you of Amdahl's law, and I'll present this new model, and then we're, we'll apply it to three kinds of chips, which I'll define later, and then I will admit that I have oversimplified and left opportunities for you to do follow-on work. All right, so just a little background uh, to get everyone on the same page. Transistor, multiple transistors on a chip. The actual Moore's law is not about performance. It's about transistors per chip and how that's been doubling and continues to double every two years or 18 months. Uh, for years, we architects have been very good at taking this uh, abundance of transistors. Think of your budget doubling every two years. You have to think of fundamentally new ways to spend money. And we did it for decades and decades. But somewhere in the early aughts, we started running out of steam and have uh, stopped being able to double the core performance every two years and have you know, gone to multi-core. And now people tell me, you know, why this multi-core innovation? Why are you choosing to do this? We're, we're sort of not so much choosing to do this as this is the default. This is the fallback. This is the failure. Um, and this picture shows a, um, a Niagara chip, which has uh, eight four-way cores, each of which is simultaneously multi-threaded, thanks to Susan Eggers and Tulson and Emmer and others. Uh, so it looks like thir 32 processors. And we're doing this. So this is not what the talk is about, but just a little aside. We're doing this because the power is saved with simpler structures. You get many more concurrent memory accesses off the chip by having these 32 logical processors. Wires within the cores are shorter, and you can do things with the intercore wires. Um, the complexity is made simpler, et cetera. But the problem is, is that it's more cores and not faster cores. So is the, is the general public going to see the chip performance going up or not? And this was aptly. Uh, illustrated by Jim Laris uh, recently, so I stole his slides. And one characterization of what's been happening in the industry is that we've had increased processor performance. And that has allowed us to do larger, more full-featured software. I might use other adjectives, but not when I'm being recorded. Uh, this, of course, requires larger development teams. When you have larger development teams, you have people of different skill levels. And so therefore, you want higher level languages and abstractions. But unfortunately, this leads to slower programs. But no problem, because increased processor performance. And around and around we went with great happiness. OK. Well, now the question is, if we don't get increased processor performance, what's going to happen? Well, game over, next level, and we have to do this multi thread level parallelism in the multi-core chips. So that's the motivation. So how has our esteemed community prepared? So first of all, I want to pick on my own community with the International Symposium on Computer Architecture. And what this graph shows is from year 2000, or 1973 through almost the present day, this is the percent of papers loosely having to do with multiprocessors. Okay. And what you see here is that we got this trend, and this is, I'll call this the SMP bulge. And Jean Loubert is here, I suppose, but I can't see him. He was responsible for like 1990 there, so that was pretty much the bulge. Okay. And here, what we were doing is we were decreasing the number of papers having to do parallelism, and in retrospect, this was the lead up to multi core. Okay. All right, so what happens next? Well, what happens is a pretty strong reaction, OK? And when I originally gave this talk, the question I was going to ask is, what happens after that? Are we going to overreact? Or are we going to have a balanced reaction? Well, uh, for better or for worse, I have two more data points. And <laughs> we are well on our way to overreaction. All right. What about other communities? So this is a PL. Uh, community as defined by PLDI, so it's a much later year as a starting place. And they've had a, here's the lead up to multi-core, and here is the reaction. And they've had what I would call, a, I think, a pretty appropriate and measured response. So that's good. All right, here's the systems community. Uh, this is SOSP in odd years, followed by OSDI and SOSP. Your own Mike Swift uh, gathered this data for me. And 
Uh, lead up to multi-core, what's next? Nothing. <laughs> now, I, I've shown this to other systems researchers, and they've pointed out that little things like the World Wide Web have happened in the interim, which distracted them from my problem. <laughs> and, I, and I will admit there is some multi-core papers in the most recent SOSP. Anyway, so I, our community doesn't do enough sort of self-analysis. All right, so let's now return to the main topic of the talk. We're going to remind you what Amdahl's law is. We're going to give you my model. Even though it's super simple, we're going to show that it has some very inter interesting ramifications. Okay, so Amdahl, in 1967, looked at software and made a simple li limit argument. He argued you could think of it as being a fraction f that's perfectly parallelizable. And you'd lose nothing from scheduling, communication, synchronization. It all just works wonderfully. Uh, and then there's a fraction 1 minus f that's completely serial. Okay? And uh, so what does that mean? That means that the time to execute thing on one processor, which we'll call a core today, is the time to do the serial portion at the rate one core does it, and the time to do the parallel portion at the time that the one core does it, all normalized to one. And then if you have n cores, only the latter gets better. Okay? And so this is basically Amdahl's law, is that speed up is given by this equation, which I have written in a more complicated way because of how I'm going to use it later. Okay? And what happened? Well, this was done in the day, in the 1960s, when people were arguing that sequential performance has about topped out, and it's time to go to parallel. And he was pointing out that, well, it's not really worth it because you know, you're in the operating system 35% of the time, and everybody knows operating systems can't be parallelized or so they believed then, and so therefore it wasn't worth it. And his argument held then, and it really held through most of the mini computer and the PC eras. There's been point successes with parallelism, but not, not great success. Okay, and so the question we're asking now is what about this, this multi-core era that we're at? All right, so the reason I'm doing this model is that designing multi-core chips is very hard. First of all, designing a single core chip is hard. We've been doing this for years. But there's many trade-offs. Instruction fetch, wake up, select, uh, operand bypass, uh, memory dependence prediction, blah, blah, blah. It's hard. And now when you have multi-core, you add many more dimensions. How many cores? How big is each? Where's the shared caches? How many banks? Memory interface? Is the interconnect the bus switch? Does it provide order? Does it not? So it's a very too many degrees of freedom to confront all at once. And so. That's why we want to see if we can use Amdahl's law to put some rationality on the space of what's possible, not to do detailed design. Okay, so you remember, we just did Amdahl's law. It's really simple, and this hardware model is going to be really simple as well. Okay, so assumption number one. We got some chip hardware, and it's roughly partitioned into the resources that we use for the cores with their L1 caches and the rest. Okay, and I'm going to assume that when I change the cores somewhat, the rest doesn't change. Which is not completely true, but we'll go with that. And then we'll zero in on the part that we're changing only. Okay? Assumption number two, that in a given chip, your resource is bounded. And it's going to be bounded by N. Okay? That's all you can spend on the cores, these N resources. Okay? I'm not even going to commit to the unit of N. It could be area, it could be power, it could be cost, it could be some multiple factors. Okay? I actually believe there's a good argument that in the future that bound is going to be power, uh, but we're going to use in our pictures, we're going to use area, principally because my co-author didn't know how to draw power. And I couldn't draw anything. Okay, third assumption is which is also, you can argue with, is that we market techs, we, if you gave us more resources, we could figure out ways of spending it for more sequential performance. Okay? And we're going to argue that in the same process generation, we're smart enough to spend our resources and get back performance R. Okay? So, what does this function look like? Well, if you can put in some resources and you can get back more than R, um, in most situations, you should always do it because you're speeding up everything. So an example of this is if you go from unpipeline design to simple pipelining, it 
doesn't cost you much more resources. You go much more, you go a lot faster. You should do this. So I'm going to assume that this is already done, okay? And so that from there on afterward, what you're going to get is a less than a linear return. Okay, and my graphs are going to assume, the equations can do anything, but the graphs are going to assume the square root of r. Okay, so that if you put in four times the resources, you're going to get twice the performance, or you get three times the performance for nine times the resources. Now, why did I do this? Well, in all honesty, the first reason was is I wanted a function where I didn't have to estimate any coefficients. Square root does that. But and looking at it further, there's actually some evidence to support this. There's some nice work by Kumar, and I think Tulson's on this paper, uh, with the various alphas and how in, in multiple generations they, were, they did seem to be getting performance square root of the area, as it turns out. And I also found out that Intel internally, in the absence of information, uses a square root estimate as well until they get more refined data. So it's not completely bogus. Okay, so how do we enhance the core? That's a long talk, it's another talk, it's somebody else's talk. I'm just going to assume you can do it. Okay, now you're a very quiet audience or else I can't see you raising your hands. Does anyone have any questions about the model? Or we'll go on to see its implications. Okay. All right, symmetric multi-core chips. Okay, so each chip gets to spend N resources on all our cores. Each core is going to use R resources. It's symmetric, so all cores are identical. Therefore, there's N divided by R cores per chip because N divided by R times R equals N. An example of the higher math in computer architecture. <laughs> and yes, I'm going to use a continuous approximation in the graph so we can have 1.3 cores sometimes. Okay, so if you had 16 base core equivalents that you could spend, and we're zeroing in on the cores, not the other stuff, and picturing area, as I told you before, you could do 16 little cores, you could do four medium cores, or you could do one Yale Pat core. Okay, so what is the performance according to Amdahl's law? Well, the serial fraction, uh, one minus F, gets to use one core, and the speed it goes at is performance R. So the time it takes to do the serial fraction is the fraction of time divided by the rate that you're going. Okay? The parallel fraction gets to use all n over R cores, and so you do the parallel fraction F divided by the rate you're going, which is performance R times the number of cores, and you can do some multiplication. And the net result is the speed up relative to one base core is now given by this equation, which somewhat reveals why I did a more complicated version of Amdahl's law to begin with. Okay, so for mathematicians, we're done. The equation says everything that the model says. Okay, for the rest of us, I'm going to do some graphs so we can get some additional intuition. All right, so first of all, let's zero in on the axes. Uh, so the y axis is going to show the symmetric speed up with respect to one core, and the x axis is going to show the number of resources we spend on each core, and this slide is for 16 base core equivalents. So if we spend one resource on each core, we can have 16 cores. If we spend two, we can have eight cores, et cetera. So that's the structure of the graph, and we're going to see a lot of graphs like this. Okay, now what this line shows is the, um, the speed up if your fraction parallel is 50%. And what is the optimal thing to do? The optimal thing to do is the point where the line is the highest, which is at one core. Okay? And so if you're, if you're only 50% parallel, it is not worthwhile to do multi-core. Uh, and your speed up is 4. Why 4? Because 4 is the square root of 16. Okay? And you laugh, but I bet you there's a lot of desktop situations where the parallelism from the runnable threads uh, may not be so different than 50%, even though there's tons of threads sitting there waiting for you to click on something. Uh, and so we have to get more parallelism. Okay, at 90% parallel, uh, we're now, multi-core is now optimal, but notice that minimal cores are not optimal, right? The optimal point happens at approximately uh, uh, 
R, R equal two, two resources or eight cores, and you get a speed up of 6.7. Okay? So, you know, we need to have more parallelism if we're going to get a lot of speed up. Okay, you don't really need my model for that, but I don't, I don't want to talk so much about sequential performance that you forget that it's parallelism first, sequential performance second. Okay, and obviously if we have arbitrarily high parallelism, then, you know, the simple cores are optimal. Okay, so F matters. We need to figure out how to, how to target parallelism. Okay, and so, you know, a cutesy way of remembering this is that we have this technologist Moore's law, which says that the number of transistors per chip doubles every two years. And the microarchitects have been trying to double the performance per core every two years, but we sort of stopped. And now we have to do a multi-core Moore's law, where we're, the architects will double the cores, provide some support, but we have to figure out ways of making the workloads more parallel. Uh, and so what I think is interesting about that is that software has to now participate much more in getting more performance. You can't just say, I want more performance, I'll write my program any way I want. To get more performance, you're going to have to write your program so it has increasingly, increasing parallelism in the future. All right, so <clears throat> this is our graph I showed you before. Uh, so this is symmetric chip with 16 base core equivalents. Okay? And the good news is that the Moore's Law, as far as technology is concerned, is still going. So what happens when we go from a chip that has transistors that can have 16 base cores to one that can have 256 base cores? Should we do more cores? Should we just enhance the cores? Or should we do both? So I can't see you, so you can answer this. Who thinks more cores? Who thinks enhance the course? Who thinks both? Okay, more people went both, they felt that was a safe answer. <laughs> All right, and the answer, I was kind of cheating, is it depends. Okay, so here's this case, this is 90% parallel, and eight cores was optimal, okay? For 256 and 90% parallel, it turns out nine cores is optimal, which is approximately, don't change the course, just somehow enhance the cores. Uh, but the catch is there's somehow we got to enhance the cores to use uh, 28 resources and get back to square root. That's asking a lot. So that's enhancing the cores. Obviously, if you have uh, parallelism very, very close to 100%, you just want more cores. Scary thing, I think, is that middling levels of parallelism, like 99%, that's where you do both where this went up to uh, three, three resources per core, and you went from 16 to 85 cores, and your speed up impressively went from uh, 14 to 80. Okay? And so the lesson here is that as Moore's Law gives us more transistors, which is happening at least for a while, some architecture researchers should target single core performance, and we shouldn't have that graph that I showed you before go to 100% parallel, even though I fear that's where we're going. Okay. Questions? Comments? Okay. All right, just as an aside, by the way, you don't have to get perfect speed up for things to be cost effective. Uh, David Wood and I wrote a paper uh, a dozen years ago. So speed up on C cores, what if it's less than C, you think it's inefficient. Okay, but much of a computer's cost comes from outside the processor. Okay, and so we define this term called cost up, is when you add some cores, how much does your whole system cost? More. Okay, and with some math that would embarrass Ed Lazowska because it's so simple. Um, so Susan's question was, is it in hardware or money? Uh, you can define cost up with whatever units you want. I'm going to show you an example where cost up was actually defined in purchase price. But if you were a designer, you could use some other surrogate for money. Anyway, so it's not that hard to show that it's cost effective whenever the speed up exceeds the cost up. And back in 1995, if you looked at purchase price, the cost up of a 32 processor power challenge was 8.6. And so if you could get more than 8.6 speed up on your program, this was a worthwhile machine to buy. And the key thing looking forward is that these cores is 
the marginal cost of these extra cores is going to be, I think, much smaller than that. So you'd like to use them super efficiently, but they're probably still worthwhile even at much more modest payback. All right, so here's a final aside, and I'll get back more technical. Uh, so how might clients and servers evolve? Uh, so in the 1970s, there was this Watergate scandal, and uh, there was a secret source from in the FBI that uh, was trying to help these two um, reporters, Woodward and Bernstein, find out about what was happening, but he never wanted to get caught. And the way he figured he could do this was to, and he didn't get caught, uh, was to never provide information that like he might only know, but listen to what they said and confirm uh, their information or not. And the only advice he kept giving was, anybody remember? Follow the money. Okay. So when you're asking the question, how might servers and clients in embedded space evolve, I think the modern answer is follow the parallelism. Okay. So we know in some places, parallelism will help performance. In some places, it's going to help cost performance. And in servers and in the cloud, this is going to work. I, I'm very confident it's going to work. In clients and in the embedded space, it's going to work to some extent, but is it going to work you know, out to 256 or 1,000 cores? I don't know. If it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. It's just going to mean a shift of the center of gravity to where it is working. And so this may be scary news for um, parts of Microsoft and Intel, but it, mean, it means that even if it fails on the inclines, uh, we're still going to be in a situation where computer science can dream up new things that can't run effectively today, provided they have enough parallelism. OK. So let me get back to hardware, which I know more about. All right, so that was a symmetric multi-core chip. And now we're going to do an asymmetric chip, which is just what you think. A uh, symmetric chip requires all cores to be equal, so why not enhance some but not all the cores? This is a degree of freedom that's now available. Uh, for Amdahl's simple model, it makes sense to enhance one core only and leave the others uh, base cores. Okay, so how do you do this? You know, that's the subject of another talk. Uh, I don't know, just assume we can do it. What will its ramifications be to the model and what we can get? OK, so we have n resources. And now we're going to enhance one core and give it r resources. And that leaves n minus r resources for the other cores. And we're going to leave them, it's optimal to leave them all as unit cores. So we get n minus r base cores. And so in total, the chip has one enhanced core and n minus r base cores. OK, so for 16 again, uh, here's a. Uh, a symmetric example, okay, and here is um, an asymmetric one. Okay, so um, how does this affect the model? Well, the serial fraction is executed by that one base core with all its resources, and the parallel fraction uh, gets to be executed by one core going really fast, and n minus r core is going pretty slow, and the net result is you get the parallel. Uh, equation done by uh, this equation here, and then your speed up is given by this. Okay, so once again, let's look at some graphs. All right, so the, the, the x-axis is a little different here. So this is, if you spend one core on the, one unit of resource on the special core, you get 256 cores. If you spend four, there's one enhanced core and 256 are, 252 are remaining, et cetera. OK. So how do asymmetric and uh, symmetric speedups compare? OK. So here is the case where uh, we have our, this is our symmetric multi-core chip with 256. And with 90% parallel, uh, the speedup is uh, 27. OK. So if we go to asymmetric, is it always going to do better, never do better, sometimes do better? Always? Never? Sometimes? OK. Always under these assumptions. OK. And so here is the case for 90% parallel. Our speed up has grown from 27 to um, 66. OK. 
And uh, even at 99% parallel, you get a tremendous benefit here. You, go, you double your speed up from 80 to uh, 166. So the key here is, according to this model, the asymmetric offers greater speed up potential than symmetric. Okay, it's much greater. I say potential because there are issues. Uh, and so, and also in the paper, I don't have time to show it here, is that the difference between symmetric and asymmetric grows as you have more resources, which explains two things. One is why it hasn't been done so much because, you know, it's a great big hassle and doesn't give you much, it's not worth doing. But as the potential gets larger, the hassle uh, may be worth it. Okay, so we should work on these asymmetric arch architectures to figure out some of the problems. Now, there's lots of problems. You have to schedule the computation, you've got to manage locality, you have to synchronize, especially when you have one bigger core working with a bunch of little ones if you want to keep that bigger core working. Uh, you've got to decide at what level do you want to do this. You know, the higher level you do it, you theoretically have more information. The lower level you do it, uh, you have more leverage because it applies to more things. It is completely unknown what is the best and natural way to do this. Um, but I think the potential is large enough that we should look at it. Okay. Um, yes? You want to comment on uh, asymmetric looking a lot like a big honking uniprocessor and a GPU sitting next to it? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so the interesting thing about this model, right, it, does, it didn't make any you know, detailed assumptions like instruction set architecture. So you know, it, are we talking just about a bunch of x86s that are separate, or are we talking about a GPU next to a CPU, or even, I mean, another thing that comes to mind is the cell processor. Um, I don't know if I have any deep comments. It, it can apply. You know, a lot about how you're going to do the soft, I mean, a lot of this is going to depend on stuff that's not in the model, right? I mean, how do you actually make the software work? And when the instruction sets are so different, I mean, the advantage is, is that they can be optimized for what they can do. The disadvantage is that there's a greater disconnect that you people have to hook together. Um. I, guess, I guess the point, there, there obviously are all these complications, but... Uh... You know, this model suggests that perhaps this uh, thing that we kind of fell into may actually not be a bad use of resources. That's true. And I think we're going to see that play out as companies like NVIDIA try to make their uh, GPUs sort of more programmable. They've already made tremendous strides. And how far can they go without throwing out the baby with the bathwater? And be as successful as Larry, though. <laughs> well, Larrabee, I'll, I'll comment uh, about Larrabee at dinner. If you weren't televising this, I would comment now. But <laughs> All right, dynamic multi-core chips. So ch children and computer architects like to have their cake and eat it too. Okay? And so wouldn't it be great if, you know, when you were in the parallel mode, you had N-based cores. You didn't spend any of them in any other way. You could use them all. And in sequential mode, you could somehow get the equivalent of R cores working together. Now, at the, at the cartoon level, there's two ways to do this. And in the actual world, there's many ways to do this at some effectiveness. Uh, and so I'm not going to say how, once again. But you know, you got this parallel mode. And then somehow, when you go to the serial mode, you just magically transition, switch a bunch of multiplexers, and while well, you're in the sequential mode, and so forth. So that's one way. And, th and there are uh, you know, people um, you know, such as Core Fusion uh, from Cornell that, that attempt to do this, not quite to the scale, but are in that direction. OK, too much animation here. All right, so here's another way that I think is even more likely to happen. I mean, that can happen too, but this one I, I think is pretty likely. OK, so let's say that uh, going forward, it, it, throughout computer architecture, the area of the die has pretty much determined the cost. And you increase the area, the cost went up cubic or something like that. In the future, there's a good argument that power is going to be the precious resource. Okay? And let's assume that power is so important that you can have extra area as long as you don't power it up. Okay? And it's not completely true, but bear with me for a second. 
Then you could build the following chip. You could have a parallel mode where you power up these guys to run your parallel computation. And they're base cores, and they haven't pissed away this square root on the resources. And then when you switch to the sequential mode, you, um, you power this guy up. And so forth. OK, and so uh, this is actually argued by my colleague, Guri Sohi, uh, what he calls simultaneous active fraction. Um, but I think there's a lot of truth in something perhaps not as extreme as this, but in this vein. So the question is, OK, how, how do you model these two different approaches to dynamic parallelism? Well, it turns out in the simple model that we're proposing, they fit, they're exactly the same. OK. And that model is that uh, we have n base cores. Well, it's just, here's the model. The serial fraction, 1 minus f, gets to use this r, this, this performance r, somehow created. And the serial time is then given by the fraction serial divided by the performance. And then the parallel fraction, hey, it gets to use n base cores. So the parallel time is just given by the parallel fraction divided by n. And you get the following equation. OK, so here was our asymmetric diagram. And so for example, here at 99% parallelism, we topped out at 166. OK, so what happens when we go from asymmetric to this newly proposed dynamic? Anyone who hasn't read the paper want to take a guess? OK, well, it always gets better. OK, there is no trade-off. If you can figure out some way to uh, actually devote these resources to the sequential, you're not paying the opportunity cost of losing them in the parallel mode. So it's always better if you can do it. So the peak occurs if you can somehow harness all the resources of the chip to the sequential mode. And if you can do that, look at that, your speed up goes from 166 to 223. So Mark, this assumes that per far is more than increasing. I'm sorry, this is assumes that the perf, perf of R is monotonically increasing for all applications. Right, so this is, so Luis's question is this assumes that perf R is monotonically increasing. In fact, it's, it's assuming that perf R is going up as the square root. Uh, and yeah, your actual mileage will vary, and if it goes, uh, if it decreases, you should stop doing it. Of course, yeah. Can we put that? When I, I'm not suggesting that you should completely believe these results. I'm suggesting that they open up the potential where people should look to try to make them happen. Susan? The model also doesn't take into account any time for switching between the two. Now, I realize deliberately you don't do that. But if you would do that, is it not as sensitive? Is performance not as sensitive to that as it is to the sequential part? OK, so let's see. Let me see if I. So, um, Susan said that the model is not sensitive to the overhead of switching between the parallel mode and the sequential mode. And that's absolutely true. And uh, you know, how big a factor is that depends on how often you have to switch between those modes. And you know, basically, all that overhead and any other overhead not captured in this model is all bad news. But I'm thinking it is just as inhibiting as sequential mode, lack of parallelism. They would have that kind of effect on performance. Okay, so you're, fact, you're, 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 you question, you think there's going to be too, too much friction to do this. Maybe, yep. Yeah. So, <clears throat> it seems to me that this just goes back to this, this question about whether you can do it. One of the reasons we got here, we're kind of trying to figure this out in real time, one of the reasons we got to multi-core is that we don't know how to uh, increase sequential performance faster than that rate. Um, so we're kind of in this cycle. Uh, and this counts on us being able to do something that if we could do, we wouldn't have done this <laughs> in the first place. The second thing, it seems to me, is that one of the reasons we've been able to increase sequential <coughs> performance over the last decade is parallelism. That is, we've been able to unleash various forms of parallelism um, in hardware that makes sequential computation go faster. Um, you know, whether it's uh, register renaming or 
you know, multiple functional units or whatever, but we've been trying to speed up it's a, essentially single-threaded performance using hardware means uh, under the covers. Um, you know, I'm just trying to think about what those next tricks are that would allow us to do this, to stay on this curve, and it seems pretty tough. Okay, I'm not sure what the question mark was there, but let me, let me try to summarize. The, the first part was, uh, let's see if I can rephrase this. Mark, uh, if we really could get performance out, we'd still be doing it. Uh, well, I th you know, kind of what happens, we were trying to get all the performance out, and then we had some problems, and we stopped dead. I guess I'm arguing we should try more. And we should try with the understanding that you don't have to get near, you know, if all we can do is figure out a way of building a core that's you know, eight times bigger than today and it's getting only twice the performance, that can still be worthwhile. I just don't think we should give up so fast. I mean, basically it was all easy, then we ran into hardship and we stopped. And I'm not willing to concede that it's not possible to do other things, particularly since we've been studying power efficient designs only for a short amount of time. Uh, let's see, so the second part was What's your second part? That's all right. Keep going. We'll come back. I mean, sometimes maybe also the square root is not big. Square root, yeah. Square root is not that big, and it turns out if you change the function so it diminishes faster, the shapes of the curves don't change that fast. And most people would consider square root a failure. And what I'm pointing out is, you know, you know, you, you probably don't want to try to build a, a super honking core, but you know, the idea of having you know several cores that are twice as fast as your other cores that could really make things work better. So, uh, let, me, let me restate my second question in a different way that will be equally confusing. Actually, this, is, this relates to it. So um, what, what I'm saying is we were able to use parallelism in hardware to speed up performance invisibly to the software, more or less. Okay, so the, the question is um, whether we're going to be able to continue to do that or whether even on that big hacking part of the chip, we're going to have to have software know about various resources there to get that speed up. In which case, now it's a little confusing. Well, so let me take that into two pieces. First of all, I, I might rephrase your question as, Mark, aren't you ridiculous? You're assuming things are either completely parallel or completely serial, when in fact many of the serial gains happen because of instruction level parallelism. You're an idiot. Okay, I'm not an idiot. Amdahl's an idiot. That's, that's the software model there, not me. Uh, but it's still, it's still a valid criticism. Um, that we were exploiting hardware underneath and the software model is not complicated enough to capture that. The second part that um, we're not going to be able to think of more things, I mean, there was this great paper that Intel put out, I think it was about 1990, that was predicting where microprocessors were going to be, you know, later in the decade. And they predicted that, you know, they were going to run out of ideas for making cores go faster pretty soon and they would be going to multi-core around 1996 and uh, blah, blah, blah. And what happened was everything in that paper that had to do with process technology, line width, blah, 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 was, you know, within 15% error. And they totally blew it on what we could do um, in terms of making the processes go faster. So now we're at a stage where lots of people are saying we can't do it anymore. And you could be right, but I also think we should try longer because the consequences of not being able to do it are not so great either. Yep. Yeah. Um, excuse me. So I was just wondering uh, how exactly would it be that it would be more effective to basically create a completely serial chip and then a completely parallel chip and put them together versus, I mean, how would, how would the power be so expensive that that would be more effective? Well, I, I actually wasn't saying that they were on separate chips. Right, right. I, but they'd be, I mean, you'd have a completely serial part of it somehow and you'd have a completely parallel part of it. Well, the reason that, the, the idea there is saying if what we're limited is by the power, because we can only pull so much heat off the chip, that it might, and, and it doesn't cost us that much to have much more area, we can consider a design where we can't power the whole thing up at once. And that's where, you, in the extreme, you get that chip. I'm not saying you go that far. But if you think this is totally BS, it's not. Intel already has a very minor version of this. 
they have something I think it's called Turbo Boost, which is like a dual core. And if you're not using one of the cores, you can speed up the clock on the one core that you're using. That's essentially saying that you can't use both cores full out, that you, you have to power one, you know, you can either power one down and run one fast, or you can slow both of them down a little bit. So these games are starting to be played. Admittedly, my picture is, you know, extrapolating pretty far in, in a place we may never get to, but I still think there's merit in, in the direction. Yeah. So in your model, in the formula, Amdahl's law formula for the asymmetric case and the, the dynamic case, both there, there's optimism in, in both sides. One of the things that's surprising on the uh, parallel side, or maybe sounds a little optimistic on the parallel side, is you get the benefit of both the uh, number of, uh, on the parallel portion of the code, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the instructions, you get the benefit both of the number of parallel cores plus the extra speed of that one sequential core which is operating at a faster rate and it seems that that may be not such a fair uh, trade-off and maybe one might want to ratchet that back and so if you replace that perf of r by another one or something like that by a, or, or maybe even didn't count that at all that might be a fairer number and it seems like you would get a different spot on your curve for where you want r to be uh, with that more appropriate. So to rephrase the question, uh, for the asymmetric case, I'm assuming you got this one big core and a bunch of little guys, and in the parallel phase, I'm letting the big guy go fast and do a lot of work, and the little guys do less work, and it's all load balanced wonderfully, et cetera. And isn't that too optimistic? Uh, yeah, well, I guess it's fair to say real life is not going to be that good. Um, a pessimistic thing would be to turn that big core into zero and say that when you're running in parallel mode, you can't use the big core at all. That's more likely in a case like Dan was mentioning, if the instruction set architectures are, are very different, like you have a cell or like you have a GPU, uh, you might be uh, not using that at all, and that would give you a different equation. Uh, I can't reconstruct, mean, it'll make asymmetric not as promising, but I still think the overall trend that it, it grows in potential and becomes significant is still there. Yep. All right, I'll follow up with that question, which is, you shown us earlier that Andor's law, you are exquisitely sensitive to the serial portion. And now you're making the assumption that you can handle all of the serial portion in this one large core with many resources. Now, first of all, comment on the reasonableness of that assumption, and then what do your curves look like if say 50% or even 25 or 10% of the serial portion still has to be handled by the large number of parallel cores that you set out, which I think is probably more realistic. Okay, so if I get the question right, um, <clears throat> it's my, I assume that the serial portion could be completely handled on a large core and you don't think that's reasonable how would, the, how would the results be affected if some fraction of the serial portion still gets done on the little cores? And what, and is, the right way, what is the reasonableness of the, of the first assumption? Um, let's see what I want to say. It probably becomes unreasonable as you asymptotically push it. In the beginning, it works. So I think what you're, you guys are starting to do is push the models to the corners, and then it doesn't work. So on that note, why don't I go forward and tell you about some of the uh, oversimplifications that I recognize in the models. So here's the three equations together, by the way, uh, and they're all very similar. Uh, and by the way, we have a website, and so you can plug in your own numbers to these equations, and of course, they're so simple equations, you can modify them pretty easily. So if you want to have this asymmetric and you don't want to have this... Uh, you don't want to let the big core participate. You can make this a one, or you can make that a zero, and you can see what those numbers look like. All right, let's go to the, the most common uh, charges that I've heard so far. Uh, one is that the serial fraction or the parallel fraction are not totally serial or totally parallel. Okay, guilty. Uh, you can extend it to tree algorithms with bounded parallelism. I know there was some good work from here. I think it was Zahorian on bounded parallelism. I don't know if if Ed was on that too. 
Uh, another really valid criticism is that the, I'm assuming that the serial fra parallel fraction is fixed. And there's an argument made by Gustafsson called weak scaling is that it's not fixed. That as you get a machine with more parallelism, you don't do the same problem faster, but you do larger problems with more data at a similar time, and there the parallel fraction grows. Okay, I think that's true, but I think there are problems that you want to do strong scaling. So if you're building an architecture, you don't want it to just work for weak scaling, or you might be like thinking machines. What about synchronization, communication, scheduling? Uh, yeah. So these are all going to introduce overheads, which are going to make things work less well than these lines. What about the fact that you know, software for asymmetric and dynamic has all kinds of major headaches? Uh, definitely true. Uh, finally, my favorite one is future software will, will be totally parallel. See my work. Now, if I wasn't on television, I would name names, but I'm not going to name names. Uh, but, you know, I don't believe it. I mean, even if you look at something like MapReduce, which naively at first blush sounds wonderfully parallel, it isn't, right? You have to fan out the work to begin with. You've got to reduce it at the, the, uh, at the end. And remember, we were showing 99% sort of wasn't good enough. And so those tails will matter in, in many cases. All right. So these are easy criticisms to uh, accept because they actually are really criticisms of Gene Amdahl, long retired, a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, by the way. All right, so what about uh, models about our, our hardware model? So it's naive to bound the cores with one resource, especially area that I've shown in the pictures. Yep, you can make it more complicated. Uh, two, uh, here's a really good one. It's naive to ignore off-chip bandwidth. That's really a, a severe limiter of our chips. It hurts them. And level two and level three caching, which can make the bandwidth look a lot better. Okay, and this has a, has a big effect, and I'm happy to say Hopefully, partially as a result of this paper, you know, modeling is now getting a little more attention in computer architecture. And there's a paper in ISCA from some IBM people that have a model on uh, caching and its effects on bandwidth. All right, so naive to use the square root of the resources. Uh, you know, the equations can use any function. Uh, obviously, when the function stops increasing at all, that's a big deal on the curves. But exactly how fast it's rising doesn't seem to affect things as much. Uh, and the thing I hear all the time is, Mark, we can't do this. There's no way we can do this, that, or the other thing. Well, that's the whole point of this talk is that, you know, we can't do it, but why don't we try to do it? So you, can, you should build better models. Our website has the things you can work on, and there's a paper that has about the same content of this talk. Um, and, you know, we should try to double, figure out how to double parallelism. We should consider these weird kind of chips. And, you know, we're not going to be successful until parallel programming and parallel computers uh, get referred to programming on computers. So it would be nice to uh, get up to 1,000 core equivalents. Uh, I think there may be power reasons which make that hard, but it would be nice. Okay, so simple model basic assumptions, and yet sort of many consequences followed from that. Reasons why we need parallelism, of course, but also that there's reasons why you should try to increase core performance if you can. That's why I don't think that the chips out there that are trying to do totally minimal cores are going to be the right thing for many things. And asymmetric and dynamic designs ought to be considered if the problems can be overcome, but these problems are opportunities for us researchers. Thank you.